Alan Merrill, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you so much. How are you, my friend? I'm fine, thank you, and uh, still going straight ahead. Um, that you absolutely are. It's uh, and it's just it's so great to to uh, to track you down. I, you know, when when I first reached out to you in regard to the Stan Getz documentary, you talked about Stan not just being a player but a character. Could you talk about him as a character? Well, I mean, that's a very personal view of Stan. Uh, he was a wonderful character and somebody you certainly should be doing a, a story on because I think he was one of the most interesting of characters in the world of music or in any world. He was, um, he was both very, very kind, very funny, and then he had his dark side, as all of us have, and, uh, but I don't think enough was said about the nice side. Why don't you why don't you help fill, uh, cover that up because I agree with you. I want to I, I want to know what this man was about the the, the good he was the a good human. Story. Yes. Go ahead. All right. What well, he was uh, how I know him. He, my f first husband when I was a teenager was a saxophone player clarinetist named Aaron Sax. Okay. Down the street from Aaron lived uh, on Mapes Avenue in the Bronx lived Stan's mother and lived Stan till he was uh, and you would know more about this than I till he was I think it had to be adopted in order to play in someone's orchestra You're at, no you are spot on he uh, he was with somebody first and then eventually he got with Tea Garden but he the, the truant officers came to find him but he was uh, he had <laughs> he had to be adopted by Jack Tea Garden yeah you're absolutely oh, really? right. yeah <laughs> now you're telling me something. It's okay, go oh, ahead. I think that, now, isn't that a character already? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, My big God. team. I mean, I mean, listen, just for the record, Helen, I uh, the year that you made that incredible album on Catalyst Records, uh, 1977, I was born in 1978. So I, okay. I mean, this is all before my time. So just, pay, I mean. What record is that? I'll look it up right now. Um, okay, I'll, because I'll, I don't remember Catalyst Records. It must have been a ripoff of some kind. You know, it, it might have been. A, yeah. Okay, let me look at. Anyway, continue. I really tell. Okay, me about, go on. Tell me about the human being Stan Getz. Well, of course, I. Um, you know, in those days, uh, we didn't have uh, television and uh, Facebook and all that sort of stuff. Musicians talked to other musicians when they heard somebody that they thought had a lot of talent. A man like Bob Shad, who was a producer at a uh, record company, he used to listen to these people because they always, when he heard enough times the name of somebody, he would then want to record them. And that's how it, does, it was done in those days. And uh, so I, I don't know how, I don't know why I'm answering that question, but go on. <laughs> Well, okay. Well, first of all, you just talked about Bob Shad, who's like one of my favorite producers of all time. Uh, but he, I'm looking. He listened. Here. This he is listened. He may not have been a great guy all the time. He made a lot of money, uh, and uh, but he he really accepted talent. Absolutely. I'm looking. He here. knew. Yeah. He listened to Quincy quite a lot. I'm looking here. Uh, Helen Merrill. Yeah. Autumn Love jazz vocal on catalyst 1977 that must be from japan yeah it's a hard record to find but anyway i just i'm trying to give you an idea of the intergenerational aspect of this of this interview. oh my generation oh well it's probably before that no 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 i'm saying my, it's oh. intergenerational in the sense that i was born in 1970 oh, I see. Yeah. okay so i, I what i'm okay so let's go back tell me you grew up in the east bronx if to an immigrant immigrant family no not in the east bronx no oh was the east bronx yes that's right but not where he lived where uh uh stan lived as a child no we were no we were no we were, we were on college avenue which i don't know we lived in many places in those days but the last place we wound up on was college avenue because of the school there was the best in new york so we went there my father went there with the kids so can you talk about uh, uh, you, you were taught you brought up Bob Shad, but again, I, I've interviewed quite a few people for this already. And I wanted you to talk about Stan gets the good side of Stan. Oh, yeah. Well, all right. Then we'll have to go ahead a bit. As I went along, I, get, I got to know all these great musicians. And they used to do uh, uh, work that was not necessarily in the band work, you know, pick up band work. And I met a lot of people in those times. And one of them was Stan. And uh, that just became, we became friends. The, the going ahead, I did then go, we'll go much ahead. 
I did go to Europe with um, uh, and to England actually to do a thing on the uh, radio, and uh, from there I went to Europe in general. I went to uh, Belgium and to Italy, and there I met um, Stan. I mean, as a friend, he said, all right, let's go up to the Scandinavia together. And, I, and he was married at that time to Monica, or at least he was dating her, and then eventually he married her, yes. And uh, we I, we both had kids, so we uh, decided to send them to a private school in Switzerland, and we did that. And we became close as a result of having children that were uh, in the same school, for example, in, in Switzerland. And uh, that was Steve. Steve gets um, absolutely. And, and yeah, and then we worked together quite a lot, quite a lot, in uh, yes, in Scandinavia, with the greatest musicians of that time there. And there were some great ones. And I'm going to have to tell you that my memory for names sometimes escapes me, but I can't, it'll come back. But that's where we really bonded and had a lot of fun. He's a he was a very great comedian, very clever guy. His, his uh, sense of humor was amazing. And he was always very, very kind to me. And uh, as you know, Stan liked to be called by musicians a nice bunch of guys. Yeah. Well, uh, have you heard that expression? <laughs> Many times, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not telling you the tales. Man. So, okay. So he, and he was, but with me at that time, uh, it was a very a pleasant time with Stan. Uh, he was always fighting his drug problem, and uh, Monica was in on the scene, I believe, or at least earlier on the scene, and she was very strong and tried to help him a great deal. She was, that's right. They were married by then. And, um, it, that, I, you know, I, I really... Uh, I really didn't like any kind of uh, drugs, I not any kind, and so I was rather uh, on Monica's side in that sense. But I, we, there was no gang against Stan. We just had the same idea about how life should be led, as far as your health is concerned. That's true. Yeah, and um, all right. So here we are in, I guess it was in Norway. That's right. All right. We were we did a concert together. And there were no, there was, it was a, it was a hall that never accepted jazz. This is the first jazz performance. And uh, Stan and I were on stage. I'm singing without a microphone. He's playing, and suddenly he starts falling asleep on his feet. You know, just nodding and nodding. And Monica saw that she almost died. She was so angry. It seemed the, some of the doctors there decided to feel sorry for him and, and, give, and gave him drugs. That's the story. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. But that seems to have been what happened. And he was then became a problem but for Monica. No, he never, it was never a problem for the people he worked with. I mean, not for me anyway. It was never, ever uh, anything that he shared with anybody. That wasn't his a purpose in life. It really wasn't. Uh, the only thing that Stan loved was was playing i mean he was a real and he loved women too <laughs> well no i wanted to ask you, you you so if i'm correct i mean monica badgered him and 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 really stayed on him and obviously put ant abuse in his in his food and without telling him and and you know was really trying to get him off uh alcohol or but well but but that was the substitute for for drugs Alcohol, they all did that. And sure. they, he used to drink full glass of scotch, I mean, a, a water glass. Oh, I, to I mean, calm I mean, his body down. Right. So, I mean, when you and him spent time together, he, you and him went uh, to, your kids both went to the same boarding school? Yes. So. And just a little later. That's a little later on in the story, actually. It's okay. So, I mean, were you guys ever intimate together? Oh, no. No, no. He treated me like a little sister. He tell really me, did. Tell me, tell me, give me an example of how he treated you good because, you know, like, like he would become enraged when Monica would pester him and bother him about his... Uh, oh, no, he, you couldn't do that to Stan. He was always his own man. Look, at look. he was able to convince his mother to let him become uh, ado adopted by a strange man <laughs> and uh, because his talent was so great, you know. He, yeah. She, she gave... <laughs> I don't know how she put up with it, but she was very proud of him. And, um, oh, no, Stan was able to um, divide his problems 
and me, for example, that doesn't mean only me. It means other people as well. He was able to do that until he probably overdosed a bit, and then he was obviously into that. But the, the Stan I know is as funny as can be. And he was, I say, very, very good. Yes, he, I, he was kind of a little bit in love with me, but not in the sense that you would like to think. A lot of musicians love me because I was really, I was just in it for the music, and um, they, they bought that. They didn't need me. There were plenty of girls around following these guys. They certainly didn't get very far with me. No, I, but, I, but can you, I would love you to tell me a story, a, like his sense of humor. Could you tell a specific oh, story? Oh, well, okay. Little, and then from there in Norway, we went to uh, a skiing, <laughs> and I'm laughing, thinking about it, a skiing resort with the kids, all of them. And Monica, and of course, Monica being Monica, she could ski perfectly, and I was a rotten skier, but I skied better than Stan. <laughs> and Stan, Stan uh, got on the skis, and there were, of course, he was famous there, so there were, the press was there already, so ridiculous. And uh, Stan st- stood up on the skis and promptly fell down, flat on his back. <laughs> and then from, from that position, he was saying, Stop it, you sensational people. You Stop your photographing me. <laughs> it looks wow, so the ridiculous. Paparazzi was the paparazzi. No, no, his, yeah, his, yeah, paparazzi. His skis were on him, and he couldn't get it up, of course, but he was yelling from the ground up, and it, it, it just struck everybody kind of funny. And uh, not him, though. He didn't see me laughing. I, would, I wouldn't be alive today if he did. But anyway, after that, we did go in with Christmas. After that, we went into the uh, hotel that we were staying at, and all the kids were there, and Stan and I were there, and they start playing Christmas music. And we start dancing around the Christmas tree, and we're holding hands, circling around the Christmas tree. And he said, Helen, do you notice anybody from Downbeat here? I hope they're not here watching this. And <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he just couldn't, be, he couldn't resist. He just saw a lot of humor and lots of things. I think his uh, becoming, coming into drugs really... Uh, was the time, the era. It seems so many people were doing that, and Stan, unfortunately, was one. Talking to Helen Merrill here on Power Talk 1210. Um, going back to the East Bronx, can you can you talk about that kind of upbringing that Stan had as far as, I know you didn't live in the same neighborhood. I, I didn't know him, his upbringing. He was already on the road, and his mother lived there. I never met her. Uh, there was no reason I was a kid, you know, I was a teenager when, so myself. When, do you remember the first time you, you met Stan? You know, I don't. I was trying to think of that this morning. Uh, I don't remember. What's your first memory of, of Stan that you do Well, have? the fir- first memories of Stan was Stan was always an icon. I mean, he was always uh, the man, Stan the man. I mean, that, that was not a joke. It's true. He had a, uh, uh, he was blessed with a talent that was unbelievable. Uh, he just picked up that instrument and just played beautifully. Uh, I don't th- I think, I don't know, I know he was well-schooled, but I'm not sure. You know more that. No, about actually, that he, never, he never was, he, he had some schooling, but never graduated high school. And That's he, great, yeah. and I'm glad to hear that. And I was out last night with uh, St- uh, uh, Cal Sloan, and, and sure. um, she was at the Y singing here, and... Uh, uh, and Bill Shawlup and Sandy Stewart. Now, now, much to my surprise, Carol told me she said, "Oh no, I never had lessons. I didn't either. We would, my father wouldn't dream of it. That's not how I learned music was right, by right, absorption." Right. Yeah. But anyway, Stan. Then I'm really surprised to hear that. Um. So uh, he was Stan the man. Do Do you remember the fir- what was the first memory you you really have of, of meeting him? Well, actually, the clear memory was working together. I mean, that was really uh, a about joy that. for Talk me. Yeah, you know, I was very relaxed. There's nothing in clubs and, of course, some concerts, as I said before. And um, he really he really was very, very admired by musicians. There's no doubt about that. And the public. But I think they liked to, to sort of to uh, see him at his, not at his best, that was sort of the pass of tempo, you know, a little bit. So he was aware of that, and he was very careful about trying not to 
be caught in a situation like that. Although I told you, these people, when they were junkies, and I'm going to call them what they are, they were junkies. When they were, they used to go to alcohol. I mean, because they, I guess it was very difficult to, to kick. And there'd be a, a, a water glass full of scotch from bottom to top, not only one, and glug, 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 and, and nothing happened when they drank. So it was it was a common way to get off the drug, which sounds crazy, but it seems that a lot of them did that. Were they doing it just to, um, uh, you know, yes. I'm no not not to uh, actually completely get off of it, but just sort of wean themselves. Like no, I, I that's why I said yes. They were doing it to get off of it. They were trying their best to get off. Can they you, really were. Can you talk? Can you can you unpack this idea that he was admired by musicians, but they preferred to see him when he wasn't at his best? Can you just talk about? Well, it? because he he had a couple of uh, uh, personalities, and one of them don't. You know, musicians used to turn their back on him on stage. But the thing is, this um, he would be very he could be very cruel. Really, really very cruel. Can you give an exam? Can you give an example? Not really. I, I know that musicians would uh, complain about him, and uh, that didn't... One time, he, when we came back from Europe, and I had no idea why, I walked into the dressing room, and we were in New York already, and he started screaming at me and yelling at me and yelling at me. And, you know, sir, nothing that he ever said to me before. And funny, I didn't, I didn't take offense because I knew already that he, he would, he could do that. So it was, it wasn't. But I was just shocked. Uh, he would really turn to another person to become another person. Yes, he really did. But um, you know, you can't do that all the time and play the way he, he played. He, I sang at his uh, uh, funeral uh, thing, and, I, and it was really a good, a good job. I think I, I got a lot of compliments for that. I guess it was very hard for me to do because I really loved Stan. Putting the drugs aside, because I, I mean, he came up as you did, even though you were not into any drugs. I mean, oh it no, was, it was was it? Uh, you know, if you weren't a junkie, you weren't necessarily trusted. Um, and I, I'm curious about um, this idea. No, you, wait, you just said if you weren't a what was that sentence? Well, like I mean, from the generation that you know, with Tea Garden and the Four Brothers and 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 Charlie Parker, oh, and Bebop, yeah. you know what I, I guess what I'm saying is there was a an unspoken thing where if you weren't a junkie, then you were not trusted because you were not part of the club. No, that is not a way it was. The junkies, the, they they they, were, they never gathered together. They were so busy looking for a fix. That's all they thought about. I I. Uh, no, I I think that uh, I I think that most of them probably would have loved to have never started, uh, and it was not a club that's for sure. Yeah. They were all a lot of them. They were in deep trouble, and their music suffered as a result. And certainly, Charlie Parker. And here's another thing: he was horrified by the thought that people, the kids, were were following him as a junkie. He he really didn't like that, and that was not his mission. It's interesting. That's a very interesting point. I, you know, yeah. uh, can you uh, going back? Did you play with before Europe? Did you play with Stan? Did you play gigs with Stan in the states in New York? I think I did, and I, but it was with um, yeah, it was in small clubs. Wait, oh wait a minute. Now I guess maybe it was at, uh, in California in um, uh, what, what's his name's club? The drummer, wonderful drummer, Shelly Mann. Yeah, Shelly Mann. Yeah, yeah, he, he. I worked with him there, but I think he was just sitting in. And I was Shelly. I didn't have any money or work when I came from uh, Europe. And Shelly gave me a job every weekend at Shelly at his manhole. And uh, Stan used to come and sit in. So and really, and everybody was there. Bill Evans and all those people wow. used to work for. Wow. Oh yeah, for Shelly. Shelly was a sweetheart. You know, we didn't. We ah. Uh, there's no way to really hang out with junkies, you know, really very hard thing to do. Uh, and I, the, those, those stories were, I mean, look, look what happened to Bill Evans, for God's I knew Bill when he was Bill, and he was part of the Bronx people. He was a New Yorker. He was a very nice kid, kid. He was in my age, a little, maybe a year or two older. But he called me the night before he went with Miles, and he was he was clean, totally clean. 
And uh, he said, Helen, do you think I'm good enough to play with Miles? I said, are you kidding? <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely, yes. But, yeah, that, that's really. But, you, you know, I mean, he he somehow became one of the, those people and ruined his life as well, you know. Can you talk, I mean, you spent a lot of quality time with Stan, just endearing friends. Oh, yes, as friends. absolutely. I mean, can, you, can you talk about what I, what I'm, what I know enough about Stan is to know that that he was he had some immortal talents on the bandstand, but he was very insecure and sensitive as well inside about who he was. Can you talk about what was inside this man and what? I think that was the beautiful part of Stan. I think a lot of us have that uh, insecurity, uh, and uh, but that I think is the soulful part that comes out in his playing. And I I never did know enough about his private life. But where he was brought up was definitely not a palace place. It was, uh, it was in the part of the Bronx that was not the greatest. Well, it was in the days when they didn't have gangs and things like that. But it was, it was a poor area. And um, so he was obviously brought up. I, I don't know if he had a dad, did he? His, he did, but but one of the reasons he was out on the road so early was because he was making a lot of money and supporting his family. His dad was out of work a lot. Oh, for God's sake! Now I know even more about his soul. Yeah, well, of course. Yeah, he, no, he loved me, and I mean, as a, a real, as a real love, as a sister, and his kids loved me too. And the kids went to the same school together. Well, the boys did. And uh, Monica was in on it at that time. Well, what, I don't remember when she came in on it, oh, but she was really very, uh, she tried to teach everybody everything, which must have been driven, driving him crazy, man, eating manners. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, sick, crazy stuff. So uh, anyway, she uh, she probably was bossy with him, I'm pretty sure, uh, uh, because he was very angry with her for some reason. I don't know. That's private. Can you can you go? I really am interested. I know you didn't grow up in the same part of of the of the Bronx, but no. What did he? Can you talk about what he used to talk to you about about his upbringing? No, he did not. But the, how do you know that? It, how do you know that it was it was a um, a, a tough neighborhood and very and there were no gangs and I mean I, I mean I guess how do I know? Because I know the area because his heir and my future husband lived there. His mother owned a building there on that same. A few streets from, uh, a few buildings from Stan's uh, mother. I no, there was no. They didn't have that. There were a lot of uh, Jewish families there, and they were there. Their interest was, you know, bringing their children up well. And uh, no, that that was before neighborhoods turned lethal. Absolutely. But the park was there. The you know the where the animals are, the Bronx Zoo, and uh, I used to walk there in the carriage with uh, uh, my baby. And there was nothing, no fear. You fear the animals. One escaped once when I was there. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I mean, Stan was, I mean, that's the thing. His loft was so incredibly hot. He would be outside with his brothers swimming in the lakes, you know, and, and doing. Oh, I never heard that. I don't know. And that's interesting for me to hear. He had a brother? He had a brother, Bob, yeah. And uh, and so um, I'm just trying to get at this idea that, uh, well, first of all, talk about what, 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 separate what made him if you could compare stan to any artist in another uh, medium what would who, who would you compare him to and what were his talents that separated him from just your normal jazzer uh, picasso i don't know i mean there are he had several personalities stan and uh i don't know that what separated him was what God gave him, what was inside of him. He was already formed when he was very young. He was already Stan Getz. He was already no. formed. You, you, you mean he just, he already had... His talent he, and his personality, his strong personality. But you say, inside of all artists, there's a little person that is not secure. And I didn't realize, I didn't think of Stan that way, but in fact, in fact, you're right. He, he was, he, he did have... Uh, yes, I don't. He was loved by musicians, so not all of them, because he'd be kind of critical, you know. <laughs> no, you're. I mean, listen. I, I why do you, why do you think he was in? I mean, you say it's inside every artist, but for Stan in particular, why was he insecure, in your opinion? Well, you know, because the the fear that you are not really who you think you are, 
the imposter. There was a book written because of the imposter. And all of us feel that inside somewhere, you really shouldn't be as great as you are or as great as you think you are. Uh, but it's not, it's, not a, uh, it's not the force that pushes you, but it's there somewhere. And I didn't, I didn't see that in Stan, though. I really didn't. I think he was always very sure of himself. Um, well, did, were you able to remember some of the uh, cats you played with in 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 in, in, Nor- in uh, Denmark? Uh, some of yes, the- I will be able to. In a, uh, um, uh, there was a great pianist. You know, I don't. Uh, Schuffo was it was a drummer. He was a great drummer. In fact, he he p- took helped a lot of Jews uh, go. They made a, a path underground, and he was one of the underground people who brought a lot of the drummer, a lot of the Jews from. Uh, what terror and, and into uh, the country, so and the piano player was Johnson. What's his name? Johnson. Oh my God! It's all right. No, you said Chuck Flores. Flores. No, 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 no. He was a, a wonderful man who died young, unfortunately. Wonderful pianist. Uh, no, the, I'm name? talking about the I'm talking about the drummer who who built the. Oh, tongue. the drummer Schufa. What's his last name? Schufa. Uh, how how to spell that? I don't know. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, that if you talk to anybody who you know is knowledgeable, they would know who he was. And the piano player there was fabulous player, wonderful. Stan loved him, and I did too. I, I, in fact, I, I came across a recording that was ripped off, you know, when we were working there. And uh, I can give you those names later in, in online. Absolutely. You know? No, I, I want to. I'm getting at the. Was it? Was it? Can you talk about? Uh, the tunes you were playing was it was it bebop was it where were you at in your what kind of music? Oh, I, I started with bebop. I started with all those were the. In fact, I married my uh, husband as a teenager because I thought he was a bebopper. He had a bebop cap <laughs> and a, and a and a, ma- and a little uh, thing whiskers underneath, <laughs> and that was a sure sign of a bebop player. And he played. My God, he played with a big time band with Benny Goodman. And that was like, goodness, look, I'm getting into the big, big time just by knowing Aaron Sachs. That was not the truth, but, but still I thought that way. And uh, it was definitely bebop, yes. And so, From day one, yes. Yeah, I mean, on the band, when you were on the bandstand with Stan, what was magical about that? I'll tell you what was magical. He understood my, the depth of where I, my, the way I approached music. And I, I, uh, I, of course, always understood how he approached music, and somehow that would marry and once in a while. And, and um, he just, uh, he was very sensitive to, to the other musicians who also had the, the problem of, of uh, oh, I don't know how to say this, of, of expressing themselves through their lives uh, yes, and he he had that. If you're a talented person and you were able to express yourself, in that in those days too, the only thing you had to be was an individual. If you were not an individual, you were no good, <laughs> and you were not part of the club. So I mean, I always was an individual, but because I was brought up without uh, uh, any lessons as well, my mother was a great great singer, but for her own. Uh, her own. I would never be able to sing in a nightclub if my mother had not passed on to other things. Um, no, no. Uh, I don't know. That was it. He just recognized that in me, and I think a lot of people did, including Quincy Jones, and that's how I recorded with uh, Clifford. That's right. Well, I mean, you know, that's we're talking to a, a, a star. How, what, when you say uh, you had to be an individual, music. Oh, absolutely. In, in your concept of whatever it was you were doing, yes. How, can you give an example of how Stan knew where you were coming from? Oh no, just just playing together. He didn't know. He felt felt it. He felt it. Oh yeah. No need. You just feel things. You don't say, "Hey, hello, I came from." No, 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 no. Um, no, it it was. He was a very soulful guy. Very soulful. And the other part, he had to protect that other person that was inside of him, of course. Everybody, and you know, he had to. He didn't come from an easy background. How do you know? Well, you just told me about his brother, and and his father wasn't there, and so on. That's how I know. 
Can you talk about him? You said you were very close with his children. Can you talk about Stan as a father? He was a great... Oh, he was married to somebody else before. Yeah, Beverly. Beverly gets he had three... Oh, my God, yes. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Anyway, that was a disaster for him and her. And, um... Oh, Lord, I forgot about that. Yep. Yeah. But, uh... Oh, I was real. I was when Well, we both had children of uh, the, the same age. And, uh... We both were musicians. And so we naturally... We worked together. We naturally uh, became friendly in that way, family style. That's what we were doing in, in the right Christmas time in, in um, Norway. Can you, can you, can you talk about uh, the way he, did he feel like he was being a good father? I mean, can you talk about him as a, you know, because... I, I don't think any musician, including myself, who travels, no matter how wonderful you are to your children, you are not good enough. But kids prefer you in a slum and one-room apartment when they're little to all the glory that you get later on, which it doesn't necessarily even come, you know. But, but uh, he, was a, he loved his children. If you see pictures of him with Beverly, you'll, you'll, you'll see that. And Beverly, his children loved him. Uh, I, I think being, you know, in those days, being married, uh, being, oh, I don't know, being a parent to... Children was very difficult. The money was not great, so you had to figure out how to have a home, a good home, and um, so on. But Stan, I guess, started to earn enough money for all that in, in his midlife and on onward. You knew one of the things that's really beautiful about Helen Merrill. I, I'm pretty sure you knew Stan before uh, he 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 became a, a pop star with the Bossa Nova stuff. Is that right? Oh yes, and he never, yes, but we still remained pals. There was no change in that. No, I wanted, I wanted to ask you. Uh, d tell me about Stan gets before, and I already know the answer. But Stan gets before pop stardom, and Stan gets after, and why did he not let it get to his head? Oh no, he he complained bitterly about uh, her getting the royalties and he, he not getting them. And you know it was, and, and that's what he was upset about. I don't think that uh, he, I don't think the pop. He would never be a pop artist anyway. No matter what he played, it was not it was not that. I mean, he just played like Stan. No matter what he did, and he knew how to identify something good in everything he played with. No, I, I mean more to the point. Like I know uh, his son Steve said that you know he always Stan could never understand why his tunes became pop pop hits. And and even when he started making became a millionaire, uh, he never really changed his personality. I mean, he was the same guy. And I wanted, exactly well, that's I, right. I guess what I'm saying is, how did he not let it get to his head? I mean, can you explain that personal character? Because Stan gets is more important, Stan the man he is, than than any other thing that could happen. It's just yes, and I I understand that very well because. There's a book written about me in Italy, a young girl doing her, uh, it's wonderful. But she says the cover is the, the, the anti-diva, you know, in Italian. And, and yes, you stay who you are. I feel sorry sometimes for these very, very popular people with all their beautiful homes and lots of money. They always wind up with some kind of drugs or some kind of peculiar following. And uh, I, I never admired that. I, I wish I had a lot of money. No, I, I don't. Yes, I did because I had a kid. That's the reason. But anyway, I don't know. No, Stan never changed because uh, he got a hit record. No. Okay, so Stan, in your mind, Helen Merrill's mind, what does Stan the man mean? As the man, who was the man? I don't know. Stan the man. Somebody just made that up. Uh, who was Stan the man? He, he's the man. We used to say, you know, the, that's an expression that musicians use for great. Musician. He's a play saxophone. Oh yeah, he's a man. Oh no, I know, but I mean, you call. Yeah. You've already used the adjectives. He was a soulful cat. He stayed true to himself. I want you to break down. He had no choice. That's who he was. It's not as though he could say, "Oh, now I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that." No, he was always Stan. He just got better at being Stan musically. He, he never changed. He didn't have to change. Right. He was. He was. He was already formed when he went with Jack Teagarden. He was already formed. Can you, for someone like me or anybody listening all over the world, when you say formed, 
Um, I mean, maybe he had his, 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 his rudiments down and his chops down, but how was he already formed if he hadn't played on the bandstand relentlessly before he joined T-Guard? Because he listened a lot, I can assure you, before he joined T-Guard, and T-Guard listened to him a lot, too. He was already Stan Getz. That's why T-Guard wanted him. He already, at this young age, he already had such apparent talent. And remember, it's an improvisational talent, so he didn't learn that from anybody. That is a gift. You can't teach that. It's pathetic when I see they're trying to teach kids. I agree, Helen. But oh. I mean, that, I mean, I mean, but I mean, you, and it also takes a lot of, you know, you just have to. Do you think that when he joined Tea Garden, um, that uh, I mean, obviously Jack recognized that he could just improvise and it was a natural thing. Oh yeah. Um, did that just come from from listening? Uh, that was just a God given thing. Yes. Yes, I think that's not something you can be taught. No, you cannot be taught talent. You cannot. He just was filled with talent and filled with listening. And I, I suspect he listened a lot to people like uh, uh, Lester Young, and I'm sure he did. Absolutely. And all Absolutely. the great saxophone players of the day. And I would say the mo he his sound is so ridiculous. I mean, Stan, so wonderful. That was his. Nobody else could really get that. And he cried on that instrument. He played his soul on that instrument. He really did. Uh, now, and Lester Young, oh, my God. I, he, all those people were very proud of who they were, and they continued on with their gift, whatever their gift was. But I don't know. You know, Stan was a... There's no way I can describe how uh, secure he was in his gift. What was that record he did uh, not long ago with a big orchestra, and he just walked in and, and did the album? Mm, I don't know. I mean, it, it was uh, possibly with Herb Albert right at the end there. Maybe. It was incredible, and it was large orchestra, and it was mu music he'd never heard. I mean, I mean, m not songs, music he never heard. And he, he, he went in there and made, made a, <laughs> a marvelous record, just walking in the studio late. Right. Yeah. Now, anyway, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, well, I don't know. If you would, all right, let's, let's take today. Uh, there, there are people around, certainly, who are gifted. Who, who would you think would be in his category? Well, I, I, I think it's a great question because we're talking about a guy who was not a prolific songwriter. He was no. just absolutely, his time feel was incredible. His tone was incredible. His melodic improvisation, you could write lyrics to his music. To oh, his, yes. And, and so, to be honest with you, I'm trying to figure out, uh, again, going back, how do you know, can you talk about musicians who admired him, that you can specifically talk, that you know admired him? Well, I know the West Coast guys were very uh, much friend were very friendly with him. In fact, they who was it the trumpet player? I guess it was who he took his ashes. He gave them the Shorty, right. Shorty to Rogers, yeah. That's right. Those guys were really deep, deep friends of his. I mean, they really were. They understood him. You know, they understood that a, a lot of baggage comes with his talent, and it does. A lot of people are very envious, and they show it. And that's not a fun position to be in. It really isn't. They, they, he, was, he was shunned by a lot of people. And not because so much of his talent, although that would start the ball rolling, but because he, um, he, was, uh, he could be very evil. He could. could you he give could, an can he, you give an example? No. I, but I don't want that side of his personality. Many other people will tell you about that. But, well, just when I came back after this wonderful couple of years with him on the road, and he, I think he had a crush on me. I think that's what it was. And I never, re, you know, I never returned that crush. But well, I'm not sure. That's the only thing I could come up with. But um, he never he never said anything like that. It's just something I felt. But um, Here's a question. He's, you said he was fully formed by the time he got to Tea Garden, but yet he was battling this other side of him inside is that right i i no i don't i don't know if he was battling it yet but he didn't realize he was battling it and when you have those deep deep feelings from actually from your family problems and your natural sensitivity um you don't you don't you don't uh, express that to anybody 
you just take it and put he did he put it in his music, which which was lucky for us because it, it's kind of stuff that you don't. I mean, I hear wonderful, wonderful musicians, but the, the kind of people that were, were around then, like Miles uh, too. Miles was Miles was very always very gentle and kind with me. I guess I brought that out in a lot of musicians. And uh, mm -hmm. what 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 did Miles have in his past? I think I know, but I'm not going to express that, and that's not his story today. But these people are not, you don't understand where their uh, individuality comes from, and they were very individual. Yep. I mean, I really want to get down to this, this crux here about, like, there was envy from musicians because Stan had all this natural talent. Um, he was also very good-looking, so he got a lot of women. But at the same time, you're talking about he didn't help the problem because Stan could be evil. I mean, you can you you have to no 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 yes he could and he's famous for that. There's a saying: he's a nice bunch of guys. Now people who really liked him could cancel, not really, if it, cancel the bad stuff that he might say. Uh, but but uh, in general, I, I I don't look for that in people. You know, no, I, I don't. I, you don't. I don't want you. You're. This is so important. Why were they able to cancel it out? Why? I can tell you why. Because that was a very, very difficult part of growing up. And you never, ever, you always put it in a little box inside your body, not even knowing you're doing that, or in your mind. And there it stays until you learn how to use that, which comes naturally at that point to someone like Stan. He had obviously, which I didn't know, but I could guess, a very difficult childhood, but could not express it. So I don't he, think I ever heard him complain about his childhood. Yeah, actually. no. Well, he was. Uh, I'm just curious. I would. I'd love to know when you were with him. You know, a, away from Monica, what the kinds of conversations that you would have, and it really, like you said, he struggled to express verbally. Um, all the stuff that was going, but I guess my, I didn't phrase my question correctly. What I'm saying yeah. is, you know, like you're probably the set. There's been at least a dozen to two dozen musicians who have said, well, he was beautiful with me, but I know he was evil. Okay. So here's my oh, question. Not evil is not really the right. I know he could be mean. No, no, no. I mean, listen, people, okay. Helen, it's not inaccurate. People say the horns came out. I mean, he was, he, but what I'm getting at is, for people close to him, not necessarily you, because really you only had that one time when he yelled at you, and maybe that was because yeah, that's it. Okay, yeah. but 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 why do you think that people, even though he could be cruel, forgave him? Why did they exempt him? Explain that. Well, I will tell you something. They never really forget that, but they also forgive it because of his enormous talent, and that they felt that that was his cross to bear. He, he lived with that in him all the time, and I think that's why he started on drugs, although that's an easy out. I think he started because it was, uh, oh, it was, it was the thing of the day, can you imagine? No, I, and I, well, it, nothing much has changed. It's just we got Western pharmaceutical companies b uh, making very cheap. And we have the kids doing it who are not musicians. Now you're, Helen, you are spot on. If they, if, let me ask you a question. Uh, why do you think that this sto that the story of Stan gets should be told because genius is very very mysterious to most people we don't understand it and you can certainly put that uh, terrible uh, name on Stan because it holds a lot of uh, you know possible <laughs> uh, envy from from other people and it did because it was seen to be so easy for him stand up and, and play that instrument it uh i lost i lost myself no, I, you don't, you no, I, no I want i want you're going great so tell me you said genius is a complicated thing to explain but i'm, I'm saying this producer and i steven auerbach we have to go and raise a lot of money from investors and why is it in your opinion that that why should this story be told i mean he died in 91 why should stan gets story be told Did he, was he 91 no, he died. I'm sorry, he died in 1990. Uh, yeah, he should. This, this thing should. This thing should have been made. That's really ridiculous. Yeah, no. he, 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 he was 64. Okay. He was like 64. Now, I'm say that sentence again, then. 
Why? No, no. no he, I mean, he, I think he was 64 years old. But what I'm saying is the the documentary, oh, the docu- documentary should have been made 15 years ago. It's going to get made now. Why do you think it's important for his story to be told? Uh, first of all, his struggle with drugs was a real struggle. And it was not when he was working with me on stage and got the stuff from doctors. That's what Monica said anyway. She was so upset, of course. Uh, He fell asleep on stage, on his feet. Now, you don't believe that he liked to do that. That's how it affected his playing. So I I don't don't know what else to say, but... uh, I don't know. That's no, no, a, I want to tell you. So why but why were you why is it important to tell what, how does that have to do with the importance? Because I think if it's going to help people understand the the wickedness of of these drugs that are going around, I don't know if it will. I think it might even cause people to try more. So maybe they'll play like Stan. That's ridiculous, of course, but or maybe uh, um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's happening, but it is happening. What is in your mind cuz I mean you had recent documentaries made on uh, Chet, ba- Chet Baker and, and Miles Davis, and they were very They hot. were ridiculously yeah, inaccurate. Exactly. So tell me, Helen, tell me what is most important, I mean, as somebody who's going to be writing script- You have to remember that Stan was a simple human being, and then you have to divest him of his genius, and how did he get there? The human being is the most important part that's hard to reach. What? Now, how are you going to do that? I'll tell you. You talk to his daughter. Well, absolutely. No, I've already talked to Bev. I got part two coming up. I've talked to Steve. But as far he, as you you opened this interview by saying, I really think that there's a lot of misunderstanding about Stan and a lot of the good stuff is not told. And I just want you to keep talking about the, the human quality of Stan when, when you were together, how he showed you, how he treated you like a sister. Well, most of the musicians did. And they did even Miles, yeah. But, 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 I, St- but Stan, I mean, this is a documentary on Stan. How did he? How, he was protective of me. Yes. Can you give an yes. example? Well, not every day. I mean, we'd have he'd call me for dinner. I mean, he'd, he'd be just a very good person, understanding that I was woman alone, and he was really quite nice to me, to me. But on the other hand, he he could be. How can I say? I don't. I didn't even like the uh, adjective. He could be. Um, there's an anger in him that came out, and even the crying. He used to be able to cry, you know. Yeah, but he uh, to protect himself. Yeah, but uh, protect himself from what? From being judged as a as a nasty person. He didn't like that, but he knew he was. But he had no choice. He really had no choice. He was too admired. He was far too admired, and he was a junkie. So you know that I'm. I'm just going to say that because I'm not going to make that a, 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 a romantic thing. It's not. It's not at all. It's he a knew, terrible he, thing. You know, he 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 had so much on him, responsibility-wise, and he was so gifted. But yet he was bothered by the fact that he was kind of known as a, as a very tough person. Tough is not the word. He could get away with very mean behavior. And the people who know, knew, know him well, like I did, they forgive him. Because I think it's a mental illness. I don't really think it was uh, real meanness. So then he'd be upset about that, that he was that he's being thought of as a mean person. And, but he was, yeah, he was. It's true. I have to confess, yes. But, um, but I, I guess so. I mean, but not to me. No, and I, I know, again. I mean, Johnny Mandel said the same thing you did. All the cast. oh, Johnny, one of my favorite. Yeah, people. I, I was just just a legendary character. Um, how about the? Can you talk a little bit about um, this beautiful uh, nineteen eight? How, how did the Just Friends album you and how did that come together? Oh, that yeah, uh, it was um, it was my record company, who of course loved Stan, so did I. But I at, the, I at that time was so nervous to work with Stan or to work. Period, that I always regret that I wasn't um, looser, looser. I really did. 
He what? came to me. He already had cancer. Right. He came up to me. I mean, you know, he's such a character. And uh, he had this huge stomach. And how he greeted me was clear. He ran into me and bumped me with his stomach. <laughs> He said, "This is where it lives." <laughs> wow! I love. Wow! He made, that's no, so... no. He and he was quite into it. I mean, he, he was not going to get well. He knew that. And you know, you have to you have to admire someone like that. You really. He had with him. Now, my stupid record company at that time, they put me in a crum, crummy hotel. Uh, they said, "Oh, there were no rooms in Paris." They put Stan who was with me on my own record day, into the fanciest restaurant, in, uh, restaurant hotel in Paris with, two, with twins or something waiting on him, two beautiful women. So, I mean, this was a lot of Stan in his later years without, without even being sick. Uh, so, you know, that uh, I, yes, I was very angry at my record. It made me very nervous and made me, quite honestly, made me feel very inferior. It really did. Well, well, tell, me, tell me why, because you guys were peers. And because you... I should have been in the same hotel with oh, Sam. No, it was my that... record date. Right, and that was, that had everything to do with your record company? I mean, what, is Yes, that... absolutely, okay. of course. You yes. know, can you explain why you would, can you talk about the way Stan was facing his mortality and why you admired that? What was it? What did you say? How Stan did what? Well, because you know he had cancer in his stomach. He belly bumped you. He said, "This is where it lives." And you said, "You." you because said, Stan actually faced life. He did. What does that mean? He did. That's, that mean? Well, that's why he could play about music. Bring bring his life, your life, to music. He knew about death. He knew about being sick. He knew about drugs. He knew about being well. He knew about his children. He loved his children. Uh, he knew about he how he could affect other people's lives negatively. He knew that. Uh, he didn't run away from those things. I think he actually cried about it uh, many times. Even though you felt a little bit inferior, looking back on it, I mean, there's, you and Stan had a great working relationship on the base. Oh, thing. yes, can absolutely. You, no, talk? but it's, it was psychological at that point. My record day, I was there with my husband, Tori. And uh, uh, it was in the, you know, all, all French places are fine, but it was a, it was a uh, I, can't, I, don't know, like, I don't know how to explain it, just an ordinary place. And in the back, my husband had a little room. And it was, it was handled very, very badly. And that's the man I really, I never forgave him for that. I never talked to him about it, but I never forgave him for that. Because for me, it was a wonderful thing to do, to be the Stan. But I just felt like, you know, hello, my record date. And this is happening? No, that was not that was not possible. I was embarrassed. Yeah, I you, was. You, you so it made were, me it made yeah. me uh, definitely not feel comfortable. And I remembered that very well. And unfortunately, the man who produced it was such a huge fan of, of he was like a groupie of stands that you know it was just it was just not not a good date for me. It worked out okay. But uh, but I still would have preferred uh, equal time, you know. <laughs> I came over from the states and Stan did too, and that's not not fair. It wasn't fair. What you mentioned earlier, the disaster uh, between. Uh, what, what was your recollection of Beverly Getz, his first wife? I didn't meet her. I didn't know her. That was before my time. I knew stories about her, but I don't know that they're true. As Gil Evans used to say, he let you. He let you hang yourself, Gil, and say everything, you know, you know. So, and then he'd stop and he'd look at you and he'd say, "Were you there?" <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I don't like to say, talk about people. Certainly, I know nothing of. Um, what did Stan used to say about her? I don't, he never talked about her. He didn't do that. He didn't. Once it was done, it was done. He didn't talk to me about her. Right. I knew the children. They didn't talk about her either. Right. Well, I don't think they even knew she was alive once they went to Europe. Went to Europe. What are you, are you talking about? Mom? Really? Well, yeah. They only discovered it after. Well, she had trouble too, you know. Oh, big time. No, I mean it was yeah. it was a, it was a it was the drug of the time, and and she got hooked into it. Um, Monica, what's your takeaway on what you knew of Monica? And how Monica came from a very uh, strict upbringing very wealthy family and uh, she had some sort of title 
I don't know what it was, but it's something. And uh, she loved to be in charge of the little people. That's what I thought of Monica. The little people? You mean like the... the like Stan and like all the little people around him. I told you she liked to even teach her how to, uh, how to hold your fork and knife. <laughs> Stan would go crazy, of course. But I don't know their private life. They, I, he never talked about it. Monica never talked about it. Uh, but uh, I, I do believe you hit it, um, the nail on the head when you said that she was bossy. To stand towards Stan, she, she was. But she had to be, you know, on the sure, other hand. I mean, sure. he, he was, she took care of his children, for better or worse. And, uh, you know, she, she was in charge. She made his um, house, in his house. Did he ever go to his home in, in, Amer in the United States, in, in, up in New York? Uh, you mean in, in Irvington? Up the, the, yes. The, the, I, I'm planning on getting there. I'm planning on getting up there. Is Monica still there? Oh, yeah, I believe she is. Well, she's, you like her. She's, she's very good, but that house is amazing. And Stan would never. She got furniture from her home in, in uh, Sweden. Her mother sent over stuff, and it's a huge place. And there's a room there that's amazing. It was it, the house belonged to a, uh, I believe, a very famous songwriter. Yeah, Ivor Gershwin. There, oh, that. <laughs> <laughs> but he had a room there that just stood in the middle of it. The sound was incredible. And of course, I stood in the middle of it. And uh, and there was a beautiful. So, uh, she did wonderful things for him. She really did. And uh, so I, I was sorry to hear that they broke up. I don't think Monica, Monica did her best. But it just was not, it was not what Dad uh, was there. I don't know. I don't. I wasn't there, as, as Gil would no, say. I, I, no, I wasn't. No, I mean, I, I, you know, just can you talk about uh, the East, the, the the vibe of the East Bronx in the '30s and '40s, and what that was like? I don't know anything about the '30s, uh, the '40s. Uh, you mean where Stan lived? No, I want your. You grew up in in that. Uh, no, I I grew up in the era when you. It was uh, the 30s. Uh, when I was a little kid. I was tiny, and uh, but the, my family moved all over. It was common then. It was uh, bad times, as you know, and uh, it was in, during the depression. But I didn't know what that was, of course. But I knew we had to move, and we moved from school to school. That was very hard, and I'm uh, sure that Stan's family did the same thing all the time because the the, the uh, landlords would give you six months free uh, rent to move into the apartment so that's what a lot of people did how do you think how do you think that upbringing shaped you when you're very little it doesn't it, it's okay so long as you're given attention and love but as you grow older you realize there's a lot of conflict in the family and that that's when you start separating yourself and creating your own personality when did that? Real, yeah. When did that dawn on you? Like you said, it, you don't realize it when you're young, but when did you realize? No, you don't. Well, when you see your mother and father arguing over religion all the time, or my my mother lost her son when he was six years old. She never recovered from that. Never. And they would argue over whose fault it was. I mean, you know, things that kids didn't understand when they were li very little, but now they're understanding that this is not a good way to spend your your days. And uh, it was very. It was. It was it wasn't sad. It was just a time that I started to to make myself to to start looking at the world in my own way. Right, um, Helen. I just one final question for you in this, and I'm and eventually we're going to come and do do some video with you as well. But um, I wanted to. Oh, I wanted, oh wow! Uh, can you please just share uh, uh, what you believe? is um, the most important thing that people should know about Stan Getz? I think they should know about his deep love for the people he loved, meaning his children. He really loved his children. And, uh, I mean, Bev must have told you that. Well, I mean, they, they lived with, with the scars of, of his many, many... Uh, he was a nice bunch of guys, but they did, the, Bev and Steve in particular have forgiven him for that. 
But I'm curious. Oh, wow. Did yeah. they give you that? Oh, you're going to have quite a movie, my dear. You're yeah. having a first person. Well, I'm carving it up. I'm, I mean, but I, I really, like, it's vexing because, you know, it, like, while you talk about just him treating you like an absolute sister and protecting you and guarding you and, Yes, you know, but the mouth did the same thing. I had a certain way of behaving that uh, I just I just adopted because I had to be with men all the time on the road, and they bought it, and I'm glad they did. Um, they realized I was talented, and, and you know that it, that comes first, and you can forgive Stan. Uh, I don't know. Go on. I'm sorry. That's yeah, fine. I just I, if there's one before I let you go. What, tell me one great Stan Getz story. Well, of course, that Christmas tree story is pretty good to tell you how, how human he was. I, I don't know if there's one great story. It's just, you know, he had a lot of jokes. He was a wonderful jokester, but, uh, I mean, spontaneous as well <laughs> in his conversations. Um he he was not an unkind person to young musicians. He was not. I just don't know one thing that I can say about him except working with Stan. What's yeah? What's the la What's the last indelible memory that you have of of saying goodbye to him? Or or can you talk about performing at his funeral? Oh, apparently I loved the blood. There's a recording of that which I somebody saved me, but I didn't. I couldn't. I couldn't listen to it. So it's it's away somewhere, but maybe you can get a hold of it. I don't know, but apparently it was very well done, if I have to say so myself. But I didn't know that. It it, it touched a lot of people. Yes. Um, and uh, what was the last indelible memory that you had of of Stan? Like, did you say goodbye to him after that Just Friends session? Do you remember that? Oh well, wow. going to his hotel. You're getting me back angry again. And uh, these two, these twin beauties were saving, were serving him. They were his girlfriends. They weren't uh, servants. And uh, who knows? And he's smiling. This he used to have this very evil smile. <laughs> and realizing he's doing the smiling for me, to show that you know that was his current uh, situation. Was nobody was going to get married. That's that was his lifestyle, and that that really oh, Tori was with me. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. <laughs> yeah, so that was the last time I saw Stan. But the thing that really moved me most was uh, that he had um, asked those musicians in California to take his uh, <coughs> ashes and p place them in the ocean and. <coughs> That's what they did. Yeah, I know. No, they, they, they dispersed them there. Helen Merrill, we've been cooking for over an hour. I can't wait to meet you in person. And uh, also, I want to just do a, an interview on my radio program with you about your career. Um, and I really. Okay, okay that's right. No, the French are coming. The French radio is coming here uh, next month and filming me. And, and, uh, oh, good. Yeah. So, good. Uh, anyway, I just. Yeah. All right, now, okay, fine. So, listen, I'm. I, I'm sorry if I talked so much. I hope I didn't say. Would you would you cut out things that might sound evil or bad? You know, what, absolutely. You know, I, I, I want to tell you. You told some amazing stories, and I'll tell you this much. Um, n you know, nothing is going to go into this without your approval. But I will say that what what I really want to try to get at is the truth about Stan. And you. Well, you're getting there. Yeah, I'm getting exactly. I'm getting there, and and you really yeah, you, and you really help. But are you going to? Uh, interview those people in California who his dear, or did you do that already? Yeah, I, I got to tell you, Helen. One reason it's so great to talk to you is because I mean, there are not those West Coast Bobcats. There's barely anybody left. Terry Gibbs is about the only cat. Johnny Mandel. I mean, there there are not that many left from that time. How is Johnny doing? I got to tell you this much. I went out to to uh, do an eight hour video shoot a couple weeks ago. Johnny Mandel, ninety one years old drove down from Malibu on his own and was as sharp as a tack. He was great. My dear, that's the secret to longevity, and I'm going to give it to you. Do till the last breath everything you were meant to do, and that's what keeps you young. Nothing else, no medicine, no foods, that. You know, Aaron's mother owned a big apartment house, and she was really quite a character. But she used to paint the apartments herself. 
And she lived to 103 years old. And so much for the idea that paint smells are going to kill you. They didn't kill her. She did that till she was very old. She lost her memory, of course. But, but I do believe in that very strongly. So do whatever you're doing forever and ever. I will, Helen, and I'll be in touch with you real soon. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.